The Castle of Adventure by Enid Blyton Two girls sat on a window seat in their school study. One had red wavy hair and so many freckles that it was impossible to count them. The other had dark hair that stuck up in front in an amusing tuft. One more day and then the halls begin, said red-haired Lucy Ann, looking at Dinah out of curious green eyes. I'm longing to see Jack again. A whole term is an awfully long time to be away from him. <laughs> well, I don't mind being away from my brother, said Dinah with a laugh. Philip's not bad, but he does make me wild, always bringing in those awful animals and insects of his. It's a good thing there's only one day between our breaking up days, said Lucy Ann. I wonder what this place is like that Mother's taken for the halls, said Dinah. I'll get out her letter and read it again. She fished in her pocket for the letter. Lucy Ann took it and read it with interest. Yes, it's a place called Spring Cottage, and it's on the side of Castle Hill. She says it's a rather lonely sort of place, but packed with wild birds, so Jack will be very pleased. I can't understand your brother being so mad on birds, said Dinah. He's just as bad about birds as Philip is about insects and animals. Philip's marvellous with animals, I think, said Lucy Ann, who had a great admiration for Dinah's brother. I wonder how Kiki has got on this term, said Dinah. Kiki was Jack's parrot, an extremely clever bird who could imitate voices and sounds in a most remarkable manner. Kiki wasn't going to be allowed to be at school with Jack this term, said Lucy Ann sadly. It's an awful pity, but still, he got a friend in the town to look after her for him, and he goes to see her every day, but I do think they might have let him have her at school. Well, considering that Kiki kept telling the headmaster not to sniff, and Jack's form master to wipe his feet, I'm not surprised they didn't want Kiki this term, said Dinah. The girls were glad that the holidays were so soon coming. They and the two boys and Kiki would have good fun together. Lucy Ann especially looked forward to being with Dinah's pretty, merry mother. Jack and Lucy Ann Trent had no father or mother, and had lived with a cross old uncle for years, until by chance they had met Philip and Dinah Mannering. These two had no father, but they had a mother who had offered to have their great friends Jack and Lucy Ann as well. So, in turn time, the two girls went to school together, and the two boys were at another school. In the holidays, all four joined up with Mrs. Mannering, the mother of Philip and Dinah. Now, in the coming holidays, they were all to be together in this holiday cottage that Mrs. Mannering had found. Oh, I wish the holes would come quickly, said Lucy Ann, getting off the window seat restlessly. I don't know why these last two or three days always drag so. But tomorrow came, and the two girls went off in the train with scores of their friends chattering and laughing. At last, they were at the station for their holiday home. They leapt out, and Dinah found the one and only porter. He went to get their luggage. There's mother, shouted Dinah, and rushed to her pretty, bright-eyed mother, who'd come to meet them. Dinah was not one to hug or kiss very much, but Lucy Ann made up for that. Dinah gave her mother one quick peck of a kiss, but Lucy Ann gave her a bear hug, and rubbed her red head happily against Mrs. Mannering's chin. Oh, it's lovely to see you again, she said thinking for the hundredth time how lucky Dinah was to have a mother of her own. "'I've got the car outside to meet you,' said Mrs. Mannering. "'Come along. The porter will bring your luggage.' They got into the little car, and the porter put the trunks in at the back. Mrs. Mannering took the wheel. "'It's quite a long way to Spring Cottage,' she said. "'We have to fetch our own goods and food from the village here, except for eggs and butter and milk, which a nearby farm lets me have. But it's lovely country. As for birds, well, <laughs> Jack will have the time of his life. "'It's nesting time, too. He'll be thinking of nothing but eggs and nests,' said Lucy Ann. The girls looked round them as Mrs. Mannering drove along. It certainly was lovely country. It was very hilly, and in the distance the hills looked blue and rather exciting.' Lucy Ann gave a shout. I say, look at that castle on top of the hill. Just look at it. Dinah looked. It certainly was a most imposing and rugged old castle. It had a tower at each end, and its walls looked thick. It had slit windows, but it had wide ones, too, which looked a little odd. Is it a really old castle? asked Lucy Ann. No, not really, said Mrs. Mannering. Some of it's old, but most of it has been restored and rebuilt, so that it's a real mix-up. 
Nobody lives there now. It's shut up and hasn't a very good name. Why? Did something horrid happen there once? asked Dinah. I think so, said her mother. But I really don't know anything about it. You better not go up there anyway, because the road up to it has had a landslide or something and is very dangerous. They say that part of the castle is ready to slip down the hill. Oh, I hope it won't slip onto our cottage, said Lucy Ann, half scared. Mrs. Mannering laughed. Of course not. Look, there's our cottage, tucked away amongst those trees. It was a lovely little cottage, with a thatch roof and small leaded windows. The girls loved it the minute they saw it. Oh, mother, we shall have a lovely time here. Won't the boys be thrilled? said Dinah. That day and the morning of the next, the two girls spent in exploring their holiday home. Spring Cottage, said Dinah. It's a nice name for it, especially in the springtime. It's named because of the spring that runs down behind it, said her mother. The water starts somewhere up in the yard of the castle, I believe, runs down through a tunnel it's made for itself and gushes out just above the cottage at the back. It runs through the garden then and disappears down the hillside. The girls explored the spring. They found where it gushed out and Dinah tasted the water. It was cold and crystal clear. She liked hearing the gurgling sound it made in the untidy little garden. She heard it all night long in her sleep and loved it. Next day they went to the station to pick up the boys. Both the boys were hanging out of the window, waving and shouting, and the girls screamed greetings and capered about in delight. <gasps> There's Kiki! shouted Lucy Ann. Kiki! Good old Kiki! With a screech, Kiki flew off Jack's shoulder and landed on Lucy Ann's. She rubbed her beak against the little girl's cheek and made a curious cracking noise. The boys jumped out of the carriage. Jack rushed to Lucy Ann and gave her a hug, which the little girl returned, her eyes shining. Kiki gave another screech and flew back onto Jack's shoulder. Wipe your feet, she said sternly to the startled porter. And where's your handkerchief? Philip grinned at his sister Dinah. Hello, old thing, he said. You've grown. Good thing I have too, or you'd be as tall as I am. Hello, Lucy Ann. You haven't grown. Been a good girl at school? Don't talk like a grown-up, said Dinah. Mother's outside in the car. Come and see her. The porter took their trunks on his barrow and followed the four excited children. Kiki flew down to the barrow and looked at him with bright eyes. Attention, please, said Kiki sternly. Open your books at page six. Everyone laughed. She got that from one of the masters, said Jack. Oh, Aunt Ally, she was so funny in the train. She put her head out of the window at every station and said, Right away there! Just as she'd heard a guard say, and you should have seen the engine driver's face. Jack and Lucy Ann called Mrs. Mannering Aunt Ally, because Mrs. Mannering seemed too stiff and standoffish. She liked both children very much, but especially Lucy Ann, who was far more gentle and affectionate than Dinah had ever been. I say, this looks exciting country, said Philip, looking out of the car windows. Plenty of birds here for you, Freckles, and plenty of animals for me. Where's that brown rat you had this term, said Jack, with a mischievous glance at Dinah. She gave a squeal at once. Philip began to feel about in his pockets, diving into first one and then the other, whilst Dinah watched him in horror, expecting to see a brown rat appear at any moment. Mother, stop the car, let me walk, begged Dinah. Philip's got a rat somewhere on him. Her mother stopped the car. Dinah fumbled at the door handle. No, you stay in, Dinah, said her mother. Philip, you get out, and the rat too. <laughs> well, mother, as a matter of fact, I left the rat behind at school, said Philip with a grin. I was just teasing Dinah, that's all. Beast, said Dinah. I thought you were, said his mother, driving on again. Well, you nearly had to walk home, so just be careful. Now, what do you think of Spring Cottage? The boys liked it just as much as the girls did, but it was the strange old castle that really took their fancy. Dinah forgot to sulk as she pointed it out to the boys. We'll go up there, said Jack, at once. Uh, I think not, said Mrs. Mannering. I've just explained to the girls that it's dangerous up there. Oh, but why? asked Jack, disappointed. Well, there's been a landslide on the road and no one dares to set foot on it now, said Mrs. Mannering. I did hear that the whole castle is slipping a bit and might collapse if the road crumbles much more. Sounds very exciting, said Philip, his eyes gleaming. 
The first day or two were very happy days indeed. The four children and Kiki wandered about as they pleased, and Jack found so many nests that he marvelled to see them. He got very excited one day because he said he saw an eagle. An eagle? said Dinah, disbelievingly. Golly, I wonder if it's nesting anywhere near here, said Jack. Well, I'm not going eagle nesting, said Dinah, firmly. Anyway, Jack, you've found about a hundred nests already. Surely that's enough for you without wanting to see an eagle's nest as well. Kiki always came with them on their excursions, sitting on Jack's shoulder. "'We're not likely to have any adventures here,' said Philip. "'It's all so quiet and peaceful. "'The village folk have hardly a word to say, have they? "'They say, ah, that's right to everything.' "'They're amazed by Kiki,' said Dinah. "'Oh, ah, that's right,' said Jack, imitating the speech of the villagers. "'Kiki immediately did the same.' "'I wish we could go up and explore that strange castle,' said Dinah, longingly, looking up to where it towered on the summit of the hill. "'Mother says something horrid once happened there, but she doesn't know what.' "'We'll try and find out,' said Jack promptly. "'I expect people were killed there or something. "'Ooh, how horrid! I don't want to go up there,' said Lucy Ann at once. "'Well, Mother said we weren't to anyhow,' said Dinah.' "'She might let us go eagle-nesting,' said Philip. "'And if our search took us near the castle, "'we couldn't very well help it, could we?' "'We'd better tell her if we do go anywhere near,' said Jack. "'I'll ask her if she minds.' "'So he asked her that evening. "'Aunt Ally, I believe there may be an eagle's nest "'somewhere on the top of this hill,' he said. "'You wouldn't mind if I tried to find the nest, would you?' "'No,' "'Not if you're careful,' said Mrs. Mannering. "'But would your hunt take you anywhere near the old castle?' "'Well, it might. "'But you can trust us not to fool about on any landslides, Aunt Ally. "'We'll be very careful,' promised Jack, "'delighted that Mrs. Mannering hadn't forbidden outright "'their going up the hill to the castle. "'He told the others, and they were thrilled. "'We'll go up tomorrow, shall we?' said Jack. "'I really do want to hunt about to see if there's any sign of an eagle's nest.' "'That afternoon,' In their wandering, they had a curious feeling of being followed. Once or twice, Jack turned round, sure that someone was behind them. But there was never anyone there. It's funny, he said to Philip in a low voice. I felt certain there was someone behind us then. I heard the crack of a twig. Yes, I thought so too, said Philip. I tell you what, Jack. When we get into that patch of trees, I'll crouch down behind a bush and stop while you others go on. The girls were told what Philip was going to do. When he came to a conveniently thick bush, Philip dropped down suddenly behind it and hid, while the others walked on, talking loudly. Philip lay there and listened. He could hear nothing at first. Then he heard a rustle, and his heart beat fast. Who was it tracking them, and why? Someone came up to his bush. Someone crept past without seeing him. Philip gazed at the someone and was so astonished that he let out an exclamation. Well! A girl with ragged clothes, bare feet and wild curling hair jumped violently and turned round. In a trice, Philip had jumped up and had hold of her wrists. She tried to bite him and kicked out with her bare feet. Now don't be silly, said Philip. I'll let you go when you tell me why you're following us. The others, hearing Philip's voice, came running back. This is the person who was following us, but I can't get a word out of her, said Philip. She's a wild girl, said Dinah. The girl scowled at her. And then she glanced at Kiki on Jack's shoulder and stared as if she couldn't take her eyes off her. I believe she was only following us to get a glimpse of the parrot, said Philip with a laugh. Is that right, wild girl? The girl nodded. Ah, that's right, she said. Ah, that's right, said Kiki. The girl stared and gave a laugh of surprise. What's your name? asked Philip, letting go of her wrists. Tassie, said the girl. I saw that bird and I came after you. I didn't mean no harm. I live round the hill with my mother. I know where you live. I know all you do. Oh, you've been spying round a bit and following us, I suppose, said Jack. Do you know this hillside well? Tassie nodded. Her bright black eyes hardly left Kiki. She seemed fascinated by the parrot. Pop goes 
Mr. Weasel, said Kiki to her in a solemn voice. Open your book at page six. I say, do you know if the eagles nest on this hill? asked Jack suddenly. What's an eagle? said Tassie. A big bird, said Jack. A very big bird with a curved beak and... Well, like your bird there, said Tassie, pointing to Kiki. Oh, no, said Jack. But, well, never mind. If you don't know what an eagle is like, then you won't know where it nests either. It's time to go back home, said Philip. I'm hungry. Tassie, take us the shortest way home. To Philip's surprise, Tassie turned round and plunged down the hillside as sure-footed as a goat. The others followed. She took them such a shortcut that all of them were amazed when they saw Spring Cottage in front of them. Thanks, Tassie, said Philip, and Kiki echoed his words. Thanks, Tassie. Tassie smiled, and her usual rather sulky look fled. I'll see you again, she said, and ran off. Golly! I wish I could get a baby fox, a little cub, said Philip a day or two later. I've always wanted one. They're like small and lively puppies, you know. Tassie was with them when he said this. She often joined up with them now and was quite invaluable because she always knew the way home. It seemed very easy to get lost on the vast hill, but Tassie could always show them a shortcut. She was an odd girl. She never wore anything but a ragged frock that looked as if it had been made from a dirty sack. Her wild, curly hair was in a tangle, and she was always barefoot. I don't mind her being barefoot, but she's rather dirty, said Lucy Ann to Dinah. I don't believe she ever has a bath. On inquiry, it was found that Tassie didn't know what a bath was. Dinah took her into Spring Cottage and showed her the big tin bath they all used. Her mother was there and looked at the wild girl in amazement. Whoever is that dirty little girl? she asked Lucy Ann in a low voice. She'd better have a bath. But when Dinah explained to Tassie what having a bath meant, Tassie looked scared. She shrank back in horror at the thought of sitting down in water. Now you listen to me, said Mrs. Mannering firmly. If you like to let me give you a bath and scrub you well, I'll find a cotton frock of Dinah's for you and a ribbon for your hair. The thought of this finery thrilled Tassie to such an extent that she consented to have a bath. So she was shut up in the kitchen with Dinah's mother, a bath of hot water and plenty of soap. In half an hour's time, Tassie came out of the kitchen looking quite different. Her hair was washed and brushed and tied back with a blue ribbon. She wore a blue cotton frock of Dinah's and on her feet she actually had a pair of old rubber shoes. Oh, Tassie, you look fine, said Lucy Ann and Tassie looked pleased. I smell nice, she said, evidently liking the smell of carbolic soap better than the others did. But that bath was dreadful. How often do you have a bath? Once a year? Tassie was extraordinary. She attached herself to Philip and also to Kiki, and plainly thought that he and the parrot were the most admirable members of the party. The day after her bath, she came down to the cottage and looked in at the window. She held something in her arms, and the others wondered what it was. There's Tassie, said Lucy Ann. She's got her blue frock on, but her hair's all in a tangle again. What has she got in her arms? said Dinah curiously. Tassie, come in and show us what you've got. Tassie went round to the back door. She appeared in the kitchen, and Philip gave a yell. It's a fox cub! Oh, the pretty little thing! Tassie, where did you get it? From its den, said Tassie. I knew where a fox family lived, you see. Philip took the little cub in his arms. It was the prettiest thing imaginable, with its sharp little nose, its small brushed tail, and its thick red coat. It lay quivering in Philip's arms, looking up at him. Before many seconds had passed, the spell that Philip seemed to put on all animals fell upon the fox cub. It crept up to his neck, and licked him. It cuddled against him. It showed him, in every way it could, that it loved him. You've got a wonderful way with animals, said his mother. You'll have to keep it in some sort of cage, won't you, or it'll run off. Of course not, mother, said Philip scornfully. I shall train it to run to heel like a puppy. It'll soon learn. Well, 
"'But foxes are such wild creatures,' said his mother doubtfully. "'But no creature was wild with Philip. "'Before two hours had gone by, "'the cub was scampering at Philip's heels, "'begging to be taken into his arms whenever the boy stopped. "'Kiki disliked Philip's fox cub very much "'and scolded it vigorously whenever she saw it. "'But Tassie she loved and flew to her shoulder as soon as she saw her, murmuring nonsense into her ear. "'I wish Kiki would leave Button alone,' said Philip. Button was the name he'd given to the little fox cub, which, like Tassie, followed him about whenever it could. "'Kiki is really behaving badly about Button. I suppose she's jealous.' "'How many times have I told you to wipe your feet?' Kiki demanded of Button. "'Where's your handkerchief?' "'Shut up, Kiki, you remind me of school,' said Jack. "'I say, you others, I saw that eagle again today. "'It was soaring over the hilltop. "'I'm sure it's got a nest up there.' "'Well, let's go up and find it,' said Dinah. "'I'm longing to have a squint at that old castle anyway.' "'So, on the following afternoon, they set off up the winding roadway, "'narrow and steep, just wide enough to take a cart. "'Tassie soon appeared from somewhere, still wearing the cotton frock, "'though it was now torn and dirty.' She had the rubber shoes tied around her waist. It amused the children that she always brought them with her, although she never wore them. Tassie attached herself to Philip and Button. Kiki addressed a few amiable remarks to her, and then flew off over the rookery to startle the rooks with her realistic coings. The children went on up the road. It was very hot that afternoon, and they panted and puffed as they climbed. "'Why did we choose an afternoon like this to go up to the castle?' said Philip. Tassie stopped. "'To the castle?' she said. "'You can't go this way. The road up above is blocked. You can only get round the back now.' "'Well, we want to see what there is to be seen,' said Philip. "'I'd like to go right into the castle,' said Jack. "'No, no,' said Tassie, her eyes widening as if she was scared. "'Why not?' asked Jack. It's empty, isn't it? No, it's not empty, said Tassie. There are voices and, and cryings and the sound of feet. It, it's not a good place to go. What's the old story about the castle? asked Dinah. Do you know it, Tassie? It is said that a wicked man lived there once who got people to visit him in his castle and they were never heard of again, said Tassie, speaking in a low voice as if she was afraid that the wicked man, whoever he was, might hear her. <laughs> what a nice old man, said Philip with a laugh. I don't believe a word of it. I'd love to explore all over the castle, wouldn't you, Jack? Rather, said Jack. Kiki, get off my shoulder for a bit. You feel jolly heavy up this hill. Kiki, I love you, said Tassie. And Kiki flew to her at once. Tassie didn't pant and puff as the others did. She was like a goat, the way she sprang up the steepest places and never seemed in the least tired. Hello, we're a good way up at last, said Philip, wiping his hot forehead. Look, the road goes all strange here. So it did. It could no longer be called a road, for part of the hillside had fallen away and had piled itself on the road and all around. Enormous boulders of rock lay where they'd rolled, and the stumps of trees showed where the moving hillside had cut them into pieces. The children gazed over the untidy, rock-strewn landscape. It looks as if an earthquake had upset it, said Lucy Ann. Beyond the landslide stood the castle, looking even more enormous now. The children could see two of the square towers with the long battlemented wall stretching between them. I'd like to go up into one of those towers. Tassie, how do we get to the back of it? asked Philip, turning to the little girl. We could climb over this landslide bit, I suppose, but we said we wouldn't. "'There's my eagle again!' cried Jack, suddenly, in excitement, and he pointed to a big bird that rose soaring in the air above the castle. "'See? You see it? It is an eagle, no doubt about it! Isn't it enormous? I bet it's got a nest somewhere about. Oh, golly! There's another of them! Look! Two eagles and together! Well, that settles it. There must be a nest!' "'You're not thinking of taming a young eagle, I hope,' said Dinah, in alarm. "'Don't worry, Kiki would never let Jack have a tame eagle,' said Lucy Ann. This was true, and Dinah heaved a sigh of relief. "'They rose from somewhere behind the castle, as far as I could see,' said Jack eagerly. "'Let's go round and see if we can find out where their nest is. "'Come on, we'll see where they fly down to. Oh, "'I wish I'd brought my camera. I could have photographed the nest.' 
They were near to the castle by now. The great thick walls rose up far above their heads. There was no break in them, except about sixteen feet up, where slit windows could be seen. There are the eagles again, cried Jack. They've gone down inside the castle courtyard. That's where they've got their nest, I bet. In the courtyard somewhere. I simply must find it. But you can't possibly get into the courtyard, said Philip. Where's the gateway of the castle? demanded Jack, turning to Tassie. At the front, where that landslide is, said Tassie. You couldn't get over the landslide without being in danger in any way. If you did, you'd find the great gate shut. There's another door further along here, but that's locked. You can't get into the castle. Where's the door along here, said Jack. They went further along turned a corner of the castle wall and came to a sturdy oak door flush with the wall. The wall arched over it and the door fitted exactly. Jack put his eye to the keyhole but could see nothing. Do you mean to tell me there's no other way into this castle? he said to Tassie. She considered solemnly. Then she nodded her head. I might know. I've never been, but it might be a way. Show us quickly, said Jack eagerly. Tassie led them further round the castle towards the back of it. Here it was built almost into the cliff. A narrow dark pathway led between the steep hillside and the back wall of the castle. Tassie came to a stop and pointed up. The other four looked and saw that there was one of the slit windows high up above them. They stared at Tassie, not seeing in the least how that helped them. Don't you see? said Tassie. You could climb up the cliff side here because it's all overgrown with creepers and then when you get opposite that window you might put a branch of a tree across or something and get in. I see what she means, said Philip. If we could lug a plank up the side of the steep cliff here that the castle backs onto and put one end of it onto the window sill and the other firmly into the cliff we could slide across and get in. It's an idea. The rest of the company received this news with mixed feelings. Put out the light, said Kiki, earnestly from somewhere in the dark passage. Put out the light. The children laughed. It was funny the way Kiki sometimes said what sounded like a very sensible sentence. Let's find a branch or something, said Jack. So they hunted for something to use as a bridge across to the window of the castle, but there was nothing to be found at all. True, Philip found a dead branch, but it was so dead that it would have cracked at once under anyone's weight. Oh, blow, said Jack. Anyway, we know what to do. We'll find a plank or something to bring up here tomorrow, and we'll send Tassie up with it, and she can put it across from the cliffside to the window. We'll give her a strong rope, too, so that she can knot it to some of that creeper up there, and we can pull on it to help ourselves up. We're not as goat-footed as Tassie. No, she's marvellous, said Lucy Ann, and Tassie glowed with pleasure. They made their way down the hillside again, finding it a little easier to climb down than up, especially as Tassie took them a good way that she knew. It's really getting very late, said Jack. I hope your mother won't be anxious, Philip. Oh, no, said Philip. She'd know one of us would run down for help if anything happened. All the same, Mrs. Mannering had been wondering what had become of the children, and she was very glad to see them. Next morning, the five children set off soon after breakfast. Diana carried the knapsack of food, Lucy Ann carried Jack's precious camera, Tassie carried Kiki on her shoulder, very proudly indeed, and the two boys carried between them a plank they'd found in the garage. Take us the shortest way you know, Tassie, begged Jack. This plank is so awkward to carry. I say, Philip, did you think to bring a rope too? I forgot. I've tied one round my waist, said Philip. It's long enough, I think. Oh, button! Don't get under my feet like that, and don't ask to be carried when I've got to take this tiresome plank up the hill. With many rests, the little party went up the steep hill towards the castle. At last, they arrived and made their way around the great wall to the back, where the wall of the castle ran level with the side of the hill. Tassie, you go up first and tie this rope firmly to a stout creeper stem, said Philip, giving her the rope which he'd untied from his waist. Then we can all pull ourselves up by it without slipping. Tassie climbed up the creeper-clad wall easily. She stopped opposite the slit window of the castle. She tied the rope firmly round a strong creeper stem and then slid down, holding the rope, and landed beside them on her toes. You ought to be in a circus, said Jack. 
Philip had another shorter piece of rope. That's to haul the plank up with, he said. Now, tie the plank to my waist, he said to Jack. Then I can have both hands to help myself up with, and the plank will come up behind me by itself. His feet slipped, but he went on upwards, feeling the drag of the heavy plank on his waist. At last he was opposite the castle window. Look out! I'm coming up too to help, called Jack from below. And up he came, pulling on Tassie's rope. Then, between them, they managed to haul up the plank and lift it so that it almost reached the window sill. A bit more over. That's right. Now a bit more to the right, panted Jack. And then, with a thud, the plank at last rested on the sill of the narrow slit window. The other end rested firmly on a mass of tangled creeper roots and on some stout ivy stems. Have you really fixed it? shouted Dinah in excitement. Jolly good. Oh, look out. There goes Kiki. Sure enough, Kiki, who had been watching everything in the greatest surprise, had sailed up in the air and was now sitting on the plank. Then she walked clumsily across to the window and hopped on the sill. She poked her beak inside the opening. Kiki always likes to poke her nose into everything, said Lucy Ann. Can we come up now, Philip? I'll go across the plank, said Jack. But a shout from Lucy Ann stopped him. No, Jack, wait till I'm up there. I want to see you properly. I can only see your legs from down here. Soon all three girls were up by the boys. It was easy to go up by the rope. They watched Jack sit astride the plank and gradually edge himself across. He got to the window sill. He stood up on the plank and clutched the stone sides of the narrow window. He stood in the opening. Golly, it's narrow, he shouted across the plank to where the others were watching him breathlessly. He wriggled through gradually and then suddenly jumped to the floor the other side. He yelled back, Hurrah! I'm through! Come on, everyone! I'm in a pitch-black room! We'll have to bring torches next time! Dinah went next, helped by Philip. Jack helped her down the other side. Then came Tassie, then Lucy Ann, then Philip, who had as much difficulty as Jack in squeezing through. Well, here we are, he said, inside the Castle of Adventure. The Castle of Adventure? echoed Lucy Ann in surprise. What makes you say that? Do you think we shall have an adventure here? Oh, I don't know, said Philip. I just said it. <laughs> but it's got an odd feeling, this castle, hasn't it? My word, isn't it dark? A mournful barking came from below. It was Button, left behind. Philip stuck his head out of the window. It's all right, Button. We're coming back. Kiki stuck her head out too and gave a railway engine screech. That's just to tell poor Button she's up here and he's not, said Dinah. Kiki, you do like to crow over poor Button, don't you? It was very dark in the room they'd jumped into, but gradually they could see better as their eyes got used to the darkness. It's just a big bare room, said Jack, rather disappointed. Come on, let's do a bit of exploring. They made their way to the door, which opened into a long corridor. They went down this and came to a lighter room, lit by one slit window and one wide one, evidently added much later. They went into the next room, which again was very dark, because it had only a slit window to light it. Dinah wandered to the window and suddenly gave such a yell that everyone jumped violently. Dinah! What is it? cried Philip. There's something in this room! she cried. It touched my hair! I felt it! Come out quickly! Don't be silly! began Philip. And then he stopped suddenly. Something had touched his hair too. Then a ray of sunlight unexpectedly came slanting in through the slit window, and Philip gave a sudden laugh. <laughs> How silly we are, he said. It's cobwebs. Look, hanging down from the ceiling. They must be years old. Everyone was very much relieved, but Dinah wouldn't stay in the room one moment more. Come out where it's sunshiny, she begged, and they all went into a wide corridor where the sun poured in at many windows. Look, this way leads across one of the battlemented walls to the tower, cried Jack. Let's go along to the tower. We'll get a magnificent view from there. 
I feel like an old-time soldier marching round the castle wall, said Philip, as they made their way along to the tower. Here we are. Oh, look, there's a winding stone stair that leads to the top of the tower. Come on, up we go. And up they went. The stone stair twisted awkwardly round and round, and led them straight into another room, out of which a narrow stair led them to the very roof of the tower itself. They went up the tiny stair and found themselves on the top of the tower, its battlemented edge rising a few feet all round. They all gasped and gazed down in silence. Not one of them had ever been so high up before, nor had they seen such a wide and magnificent view. What a wonderful place this must have been for a lookout, said Philip. Any sentry here could see enemies coming miles and miles away. Look, is that spring cottage right down there among those trees? It was, looking like a doll's house halfway down the hill. I wish we could bring Mother up here, said Dinah. How she'd love this view. Look, look, there are the eagles again, said Jack. And he pointed up in the air where two great eagles soared to the clouds. I say... Shall we have our lunch here, on top of this tower, and see this marvellous view all the time, and watch my eagles? Oh, yes, said everyone, including Kiki. She always joined in any chorus. Poor little button, said Philip. I wish we could have brought him too, but it was too risky across that plank. I expect he's feeling very lonely now. I hope he won't run off. Dinah divided out sandwiches, cake, biscuits, fruit, and chocolate. Then she presented everyone with a cardboard cup of lemonade from a bottle. We've had plenty of picnics in our time, said Philip, biting hugely into a thick sandwich of egg and ham, but never one in such an extraordinary place as this. It almost makes me giddy, looking out at that enormous view. Jack had been watching the eagles, which all the time they were at lunch had been soaring high in the air, looking like black specks. Now they were coming down again gliding in large circles, their great wings spread out to catch the smallest current of air. They watched the eagles go lower and lower. Below them and behind them lay the inner courtyard of the castle. It was overgrown with grass and patches of heather. Gorse bushes grew there and a few small birch trees. I believe the eagles have their nest in that clump of trees over there in the corner of the courtyard, said Jack excitedly. Shall we go and see? Are you sure they're not dangerous? said Philip doubtfully. They're awfully big birds, and I have heard stories of them attacking men. Yes, said Jack. Well, as soon as they fly off again, I'll go and look. Anyway, we might as well go down now and have a look round. Kiki, come here. Kiki flew to his shoulder and nibbled his ear gently, talking her usual nonsense. The children got up and went down the two stone stairways. How do we get down to the courtyard? wondered Philip. We'll have to go back along the wall and into the castle itself, I suppose. There must be a stairway down to the rooms below. So back they went and came to the main building of the castle again. They looked into room after room, all empty. Then at last they came to a very wide stone stairway that led down and down. They clattered down it and came into a big hall. It was dark. Something suddenly hurled itself against Philip's legs, and he leapt in fright, giving a loud exclamation. What is it? said Lucy Ann in a whisper. It was Button, the fox cub. Now how in the world did he get to us? cried Philip, picking the little creature up. He must have found some hole, I suppose, and scrambled through it to find us. Button, you're a marvel. But my word, you did give me a fright. Now let's get into the courtyard and explore around a bit, said Jack. Look out for the eagles, all of you. The children picked their way over the big, overgrown courtyard towards a towering piece of rock, clothed here and there with heather, that rose up at one end of the courtyard. You girls stay down at the bottom of this crag, said Jack. I'm going to climb up with Philip. The boys were just beginning to climb when a loud, yelping scream made them stop and clutch at one another in fright. The girls jumped violently. Button ran into the nearest rabbit hole and stayed there. Only Kiki seemed not to be frightened. What was it, Jack? whispered Lucy Ann. Come back. Don't go up there. The scream came from there. 
It came again, more loudly, a curious, almost yelping noise. Kiki cleared her throat to imitate it. She gave a remarkably good imitation of the scream and made everyone jump again. Bad bird, naughty bird, said Jack fiercely in a low voice. Kiki looked at him. From her throat came the scream again, and, almost at the same moment, a great eagle, which must have been somewhere on the rocky crag, rose up in the air on enormous wings and soared over the little company, looking down in amazement to see who had made such a noise. And then, from the eagle's own throat, there came again the yelping scream the children had heard. Gosh! It was the eagle screaming, that's all, said Jack in relief. I've never heard one before. That shows their nest must be somewhere up there. Come on, Philip. The eagle didn't swoop down to the children, but glided above them, looking down. Its interest was centred on Kiki, who, feeling rather thrilled at having found such a good new noise, yelped again. The eagle answered and flew lower. Kiki went up to meet it, looking very small compared with the big eagle. It is a golden eagle, said Lucy Ann. Jack was right. Look at those golden feathers. Oh dear, I hope it doesn't come any lower. All the five children watched Kiki and the eagle. Usually, birds were either puzzled and afraid of Kiki, or angry. But the eagle was neither. It seemed intensely interested, as if wondering how it was that this queer-looking little bird, so unlike an eagle, could make eagle noises. Finally, it flew upwards to a high rock on the crag and perched there, looking down in a very royal fashion. Isn't it a magnificent bird, said Jack in the utmost delight. Fancy us seeing an eagle at close quarters like this. There's the second eagle. Look, said Lucy Ann suddenly in a low voice. The children saw the other eagle rising up into the air from the crag, evidently curious to see what was happening. It soared upwards, spreading out its strong pinions like fingers, its wingtips curving up as it went. And then, quite suddenly... The first eagle, tired of Kiki, flapped its enormous wings and joined its mate. You ought to have snapped that eagle sitting on the crag, said Philip. Jack gave an exclamation of annoyance. Oh, blow! I never even thought of my camera. I was so absorbed in watching the birds. What marvellous pictures I could take. The two birds were now only specks in the sky, for they'd soared up to an immense height. It'd be a jolly good chance to explore this crag for their nest while they're safely up there, said Jack. The boys began to climb up again. It was fairly stiff going, for the little crag was steep and rocky. Its top was almost as high as the nearby tower. On the western side, well hidden in a little hollow, Jack found what he wanted. The eagle's nest. Look, he said, look! Did you ever see such an enormous thing, Philip? It must be six feet wide at the bottom. The boys looked at the great nest on the broad ledge of rock. It was about two feet high, made of twigs and small boughs with heather tucked in between. There's a young one in the nest, said Jack in delight. Quite a big bird, too. Must be more than three months old and ready to fly. The young bird crouched down in the nest when it heard Jack's voice. It was already so big that Philip would hardly have known it was a nestling. But Jack's sure eye had noticed the white bases of the feathers, telling him that this was a young eagle and not an old one. Kiki flew inquisitively to the nest. She gave a yelp like the eagle had made. The young bird looked up inquiringly, recognised the sound, but not the maker of it. "'Your camera, quick!' whispered Philip and Jack began to adjust his camera with quick, eager fingers. Quick! The old eagles are coming back, whispered Philip. And Jack gave a glance upwards. The eagles had remembered their young one, and seeing the boys so near the nest were coming down to see what was happening. Jack snapped the camera just in time, for Kiki flew off almost immediately to meet the eagles, screaming a welcome. We'd better get down now, said Philip. 
thinking the two old eagles look pretty fierce. My word, I wish we could take pictures of the young one learning to fly. It looks as if it'll take off from the nest any day now. With the two eagles gliding not far above them, the boys climbed down as hastily as they could. Did you get a snap? asked Lucy Ann eagerly, and Jack nodded. He looked excited. I shall have to come back again, he said. Do you know, I might get finer close-up pictures of eagles than anyone has ever got before. Think of that. I'd make a lot of money out of them, I dare say, and I'd have them in all kind of nature magazines. Oh, Jack, do take some more pictures then, said Lucy Ann, her eyes shining. I'd have to almost live up there to take good ones, said Jack. It's no good just coming up on the off chance. If only I could spend a few days here, I could make a hide, you know, and... What's a hide? asked Tassie, speaking for almost the first time that morning. A hide? Oh, it's, it's a place I should rig up to hide myself and my camera in, said Jack. I might take a whole set of pictures showing the young eagle learning to fly. Well, ask Mother if you can come up then, said Philip. You'll have Kiki for company, and we'll come up and see you every day. Come on now, let's explore the lower parts of the castle a bit more. So they made their way back across the yard into the lower parts of the great building, expecting to see the same vast empty rooms there as they'd seen above. But what a surprise they got. They went into a great doorway and walked across the dark hall, which echoed strangely with their footsteps. From outside came the yelping scream of the eagles again. I expect it was the screams of the eagles that the villagers heard year after year up here, said Jack, as he made his way to a stout door that led off the hall. He opened it, and then stood still in surprise. This room was furnished. It had once been a kind of sitting room or drawing room, and the mouldy old furniture was still there. Dinah shivered. When the others went further into the room, walking on tiptoe and talking in whispers, she did not follow. Lucy Ann patted a chair, and at once a cloud of dust arose, making her choke. Philip pulled at a cover on one of the sofas, and it fell to pieces in his hands. It was quite rotten. They went out and into the next one. That was quite empty, but the third one, smaller, and evidently used as a dining room, was again furnished. And again, the spider's webs stretched everywhere and hung down in long grey threads from the high ceilings. Curiouser and curiouser, said Lucy Ann, quoting Alice in Wonderland. Why have these rooms been left like this? I expect the wicked old man Tassie told us about just lived in a few rooms, and these were the ones, said Jack. Maybe he went away, meaning to come back, and never did. And nobody dared to come here, or perhaps nobody even knew that the rooms had been left furnished. It's a mystery. The little fox cub went sniffing all round the rooms, raising clouds of dust and choking now and again. Kiki didn't seem to like the rooms. She stayed on Jack's shoulder, quite silent. They came to the kitchen. This was a simply enormous place with a great cooking range at the back. Iron saucepans and an iron kettle were still there. Philip tried to lift one, but it was immensely heavy. <laughs> Cooks must have had very strong arms in the old days, he said. Look, is that a pump by the old sink? I suppose they had to pump their water up. They crossed over to the sink. The old-fashioned pump had a handle, which had to be worked up and down in order to bring water from some deep-down well. Philip stared at it in a puzzled manner, his eyes going to a puddle on the floor just below the pump. "'What's the matter, Philip?' said Jack. "'Nothing much, but where did that water come from?' said Philip. "'See? It's in a puddle. It can only have been there a day or two, or it would have dried up.' Jack, too, felt puzzled. "'Let's pump a bit and see if water comes up,' he said, and stretched out his hand. Before he could reach the handle, Philip knocked his hand aside with an exclamation. Jack looked at him in surprise. See here, said Philip, the handle of the pump isn't covered with dust like everything else is. It's rubbed clean just where you take hold of it to pump. Dinah felt a little prickle of fright go down her back. Whatever did Philip mean? Who could pump up water in an old empty castle? 
They all stared at the pump handle and saw that Philip was right. Button began to lap up the puddle of water on the stone floor. Wait, Button, I'll pump you some fresh water, said Philip, and he took hold of the pump handle. He worked it up and down vigorously, and fresh, clear water poured in gushes into the huge old sink. Some of it splashed out into the puddle already on the floor. That's how the puddle was made, said Jack, watching carefully. But that means someone must have pumped up water here in the last few days. Tassie's eyes grew big with fright. The wicked old man's still here, she said and she looked fearfully over her shoulder, as if she expected him to walk into the kitchen. "'Don't be so silly, Tassie,' said Philip impatiently. "'The old man's dead and gone years and years ago. "'Do you know if any of the villagers ever come up here?' "'No, oh no,' said Tassie. "'They're afraid of the castle. "'They say it's a bad place.' The five children certainly felt it had a strange, brooding air about it. They felt that they wanted to go out into the sunshine. Kiki suddenly gave a mournful groan that made them all jump. Don't, Kiki, said Jack crossly. Philip, what do you make of this? Who's been pumping up the water? Can there be anyone in the castle now? Well, we haven't seen signs of anyone at all, said Philip. And why should anyone be here anyway? There's nothing for them to live on. There's no food or anything. I think myself that probably some rambler came up here in curiosity, wandered about, got himself a drink of water from the pump before he went. This seemed the most likely explanation. But how did he get in? said Dinah, after a moment or two. Well, there must be some way, said Jack. There isn't, said Tassie. I've been all round the castle, and I know there isn't any way of getting in. Well, there must be, said Philip. Come on, let's find a comfortable place in the courtyard and have our tea. I'm jolly hungry again. They went into the hot and sunny courtyard. They sat down, and Dinah undid the tea packet. There was plenty there for everyone, but all the lemonade had been drunk at dinner time. I'm so thirsty, I simply must have something to drink with my sandwiches, said Lucy Ann. My tongue will hang out like a dog's in a minute. Everyone felt the same, but nobody particularly wanted to go into that big, lonely kitchen and bring back water in the cardboard cups. I know. We'll see if the spring that runs down to our cottage is anywhere about, said Philip. It's supposed to begin in this courtyard, I know. He got up and Button went with him. It was Button who found the spring. It gushed out near the wall that ran round the castle, almost at the foot of the tower. Jack looked with interest at the bubbling spring. It gushed out from a hole in the rock and then disappeared again under a tangle of brambles into a kind of little tunnel that ran below the tower. I suppose it goes right underneath the tower and comes out again further on down the hillside, thought the boy. The children enjoyed the icy cold water. They finished all the tea and lay back in the sun, watching the golden eagles who were once more soaring upwards on wide wings. This has been an exciting sort of day, said Philip lazily. What do you feel now about spending a few days here, Jack? Won't you be too lonely? I'll have Kiki and the eagles, said Jack, <laughs> and all the rabbits round about too. I wouldn't like to be here all alone now, said Dinah. Not until I knew who pumped that water, I should feel creepy all the time. Jack, you won't really stay here by yourself, will you? <laughs> I don't see why not, said Jack with a laugh. I'm not scared. I think Philip's right when he says it was probably only some rambler who pumped himself a spot of water. After all, if we're curious enough to make our way in here, other people may be too. Yes, but how did they come? persisted Dinah. <laughs> Same way as old Button came in, I expect, said Philip. Dinah stared at him. Well, how did Button get in? she said. Find out that, and we don't need to use the plank every time. I know what we'll do, said Jack. We'll leave old Button behind here when we go across the plank, and we'll watch and see where he comes out. Then we can use his entrance, if it's possible, the next time we come. Yes, that's a good idea, said Lucy Ann, and Tassie nodded too. The little girl was puzzled to know how Button had got into the castle. She felt so certain there was no way in beside the two doors and the window through which they themselves had come. Come on, time to go home, said Jack, and they all got up. I'll be back here tomorrow, I hope. They went back into the castle and up the wide stone stair. Diana felt a little uncomfortable and kept close to the others. So did Tassie. 
They went down the wide corridor and looked in room after room to find the one with the plank. Golly, don't say it's gone, said Jack, after they'd looked into about six rooms. This is odd. I'm sure the room wasn't as far along as this. But it was, for in the very next room they saw the edge of their plank on the stone sill. They hurried over to it. Jack went across first with Kiki clutching his shoulder. He got across safely and then caught hold of the rope on the other side. He helped Lucy Ann across, then Dinah, and then Tassie. Lucy Ann slipped hurriedly down the cliffside, followed by Dinah. Tassie leapt down like a goat, without even touching the rope. Then came Philip, and poor little Button was left behind, yelping. You go your own way and join us outside the castle, called back Philip. Button jumped up to the sill, but kept falling back. The children heard him barking away by himself as they made their way down the tunnel-like passage into the sunshine. "'I may have to go back for Button, you know, if he doesn't come after us,' said Philip. "'I couldn't really leave him behind, but foxes are so sharp. I bet he'll come rushing after us in a minute.' "'Keep a good lookout, then,' said Jack. But it wasn't any good keeping a lookout, for suddenly Button was at their heels, leaping up at Philip, making yelping sounds of happiness and love. Nobody saw him come. Nobody knew how he had got out of the castle. <laughs> how annoying, said Jack with a laugh. Button, how did you get out? They were all so tired when they got in that they could hardly tell their adventures. When Philip told about the puddle of water below the pump, Mrs. Mannering laughed. <laughs> Trust you children to imagine something to scare yourselves with, she said. Probably the pump leaks a bit on its own. It's funny about those old furnished rooms, though. It shows how the villagers fear the castle if no one has interfered with the furniture. Even thieves, apparently, will not venture there. Mrs. Mannering was intensely interested in the golden eagles. She and Philip and Jack talked about them till darkness fell. Mrs. Mannering was quite willing for Jack to try and take pictures of the young eagle with its parents. If only you could make a good hide, she said, and get the birds used to it, so that you can lie there and take what pictures you please. It would be marvellous. Philip's father used to do things like that. Can I go with Jack, please, Auntie Ally? asked Lucy Ann, who couldn't bear to let Jack go off by himself for even a day or two. No, you can't, Lucy Ann. You can come up each day and bring me food if you like, said Jack, as he saw Lucy Ann's disappointed face. And I can always signal to you from the tower. You know, we could see this house from the tower, so of course you could see the tower from this house. Oh, yes, you signal good night to us each night, said Lucy Ann, cheering up. That'd be fun. I shall look at the tower when I wake and know you're there. I'll wave a white hanky from my window when I see you waving one. Tassie couldn't imagine how anyone could possibly dare to sleep alone in the old castle. She thought Jack must be the bravest boy in the world. "'Time for you to go home, Tassie,' said Mrs. Mannering. "'Go along. You can come back tomorrow.' Tassie disappeared, running off to her tumble-down cottage and her scolding, untidy mother. The others helped Mrs. Mannering to clear the supper away, and the two girls washed up, half asleep. They went to bed, to dream of the old deserted castle of strange, cobwebby rooms, high towers, screaming eagles, and a puddle on the floor below the pump. That's really a puzzle, said Philip to himself as he fell asleep. <sighs> but I'm too tired to think about it now. <sighs> the next day was rainy. Great clouds swept over the hillside, making it misty and damp. Blow, said Jack. I did want to go up to the castle today. I feel that young eagle may fly at any time now, and I don't want to miss its first flight. Have you got plenty of film for your camera? asked Philip. Well, it wouldn't be much good wanting them if I hadn't got enough, said Jack. I couldn't buy them in that tiny village as only one shop. You could take the train and go off to the town, said Mrs. Mannering. Why don't you do that, instead of staying here cooped up all day? I can see Dinah is longing to squabble with someone. Dinah laughed. Yes, it would be fun to take the train and go off shopping, she said. Let's do it. So they put on Max and Sou'Westers and hurried to catch the train. It was twenty miles to the nearest town. It took the train a whole hour to get there. The children had left the train and were walking down the street when suddenly a voice hailed them and made them jump. Hello, hello. Whoever would have thought of seeing you here? 
The children turned round at once, and Kiki let out a delighted squawk. Bill Smugs! cried the children, and ran to the ruddy-faced, twinkling-eyed man who had hailed them. Lucy Ann gave him a hug, Dinah smiled in delight, and the two boys banged Bill Smugs on the back. Bill Smugs was not his real name. It was a name he'd told the children the year before, when they'd come across him trying to track some clever forgers. <laughs> come and have lunch with me, said Bill Smugs. Or have you any other plans? I really must know what you're doing here. I thought you were at home for the holidays. What are you doing here? asked Philip. On the track of forgers again? I bet you're on some sort of exciting job. <laughs> maybe, maybe not, said Bill, smiling. Come on, we'll go to this hotel. It looks about the best one this town can produce. <laughs> it was an exciting lunch. Bill Smugs was an exciting person. They talked eagerly about the thrilling adventures he'd had with them the year before. Oh, yes, that certainly was an adventure, said Bill, helping himself to apple tart and ice cream. And now, as I said before, you really must tell me what you're doing in this part of the world. The children told him, interrupting each other in their eagerness, especially Jack, who was longing to tell him every detail about the eagles. Bill listened and ate solidly, giving Kiki titbits every now and again. What a pity you're twenty miles away or more, said Bill. I'm stuck here in this district for a time I'm afraid I can't leave. But if I can, I'll come over and see you. Maybe your mother would put me up for a day or two, then I can come up to this wonderful castle of yours and see the eagles. Oh, yes, do come, they all cried. We aren't on the telephone, added Philip, but never mind, just come. We're sure to be there. Come at any time. Right, said Bill. I might be able to slip over next week. Can't tell you any more, I'm afraid, but if I don't make any headway with what I'm supposed to be doing, I'll have a break. Come along to see you and your nice mother. Give her my kind regards and say Bill Smugs will come and pay his respects if he possibly can. We'll have to go, said Jack, regretfully looking at his watch. There's only the one train back and we've got a bit of shopping to do. Goodbye, Bill. It's been grand to bump into you like this. <laughs> Goodbye. See you soon, I hope, said Bill and off they ran to catch their train. Mrs. Mannering was delighted to hear that they had by chance met Bill Smugs again, for she felt very grateful to him for the help he'd given the children in their amazing adventure the year before. If he comes, I'll sleep in with you girls and he can have my room, she said. Good old Bill. It'll be nice to see him again. He must lead an interesting life, always hunting down criminals and wicked people. I bet he'd have been after the wicked old man who used to live in the castle, said Lucy Ann. It'll be fun taking him up there, Jack. I hope it won't be raining again tomorrow. Luckily, it was fine. The sun rose out of a clear sky, and not even the smallest cloud showed itself. We'll all come up with you, Jack, said Philip, and help you carry what you want. You'll need a couple of thick rugs and some food, a, a candle or two, and a torch, and your camera, and films, of course. Carrying various things, the little party set off once more. Dinah was glad to feel her torch safely in her pocket. She didn't mean to stand in dark rooms again and feel cobwebs clutching at her hair. They climbed in through the window as before. Button again appeared in the courtyard from somewhere, though still no one knew where. Kiki flew to the crag on which the eagles had their nest, yelping her eagle scream in what was plainly meant to be a kindly greeting. The startled eagles rose up in surprise, and then, seeing the strange and talkative bird again, circled round her. Quite clearly, they didn't mind her in the least. It wasn't long before Jack climbed up to see if the young eagle was still in the nest. It was. He looked around for a place to make a good hide in. There was one spot that looked ideal. It was a thick gorse bush, almost on a level with the eagle's ledge. Jack thought he could probably squeeze into the hollow middle of it and make an opening for his camera in the prickly branches. The only thing is, I'll get terribly pricked, he thought. He told the others, and they agreed with him that it would be a splendid place, if a bit painful. You'll have to wrap this rug round you, said Lucy Ann, holding up the thick rug she'd brought. If you creep in with this round you, you'll be all right. Good idea, said Jack. They went up to the tower top and had their dinner there again, seeing the countryside spread out below once more in all its beauty. I'd like Bill Smugs to see this, said Jack, 
We must bring him up here when he comes. Where do you think you'll sleep tonight, Jack? asked Lucy Ann anxiously. And will you wave your hanky from the tower before you go to sleep? I'll watch for it. I'll wave my white shirt, said Jack. You probably wouldn't notice anything so small as a hanky, though you can borrow my old field glasses and look through them if you like. They're in my room. Oh, yes, I will, said Lucy Ann. You haven't said where you'll sleep, Jack. You won't really sleep on one of those old sofas, will you? No, I don't think so. More likely in a sandy corner of the courtyard, said Jack. There's a sandy bit over there. Look, it'll be warm with the sun. If I curl up there and wrap the rugs all round me, I'll be very snug. Well, it's time for us to go, said Philip at last. Jack said goodbye to them all as they went across the plank. He held Button in his arms, quite determined to follow him and find out where he went when he got out of the castle. One by one they crossed the plank and disappeared. Their voices died away. Jack was alone. He went down the wide corridor, down the stone stairway that led to the dark hall and out into the courtyard, where the last rays of the sun still shone. When he came to the yard, he set the wriggling fox cub down. Now, you show me where you go, he said. Button darted off at once, far too quickly for Jack. By the time the boy had run a few steps after him, the fox cub had disappeared, and there was no trace of him. Oh, blow, said Jack, annoyed. I did mean to discover the way you went out this time, but you're so jolly nippy. I suppose you've already joined the others now. Jack went to try and arrange his camera safely in the gorse bush. He had a very good camera indeed, given to him last Christmas by Bill Smuggs. He wrapped one of the rugs round him, as Lucy Ann had suggested, and began to squeeze through the prickly branches. Some of the prickles reached his flesh even through the thick rug. Kiki sat beside the bush, watching Jack in surprise. Ah, what a pity! What a pity! What a pity! It is a pity that I'm being pricked like this, groaned Jack. But he cheered up when he saw what a fine view of the eagle's nest he had, and of the ledge where the eagle sat to look out at the surrounding country. By making an opening in the bush on the side where the nest was, he managed to point his camera in exactly the right direction, and lodged it very firmly on its tripod legs. He looked through it to see what kind of a picture he would get. Perfect, thought the boy joyfully. I won't take one now because the light is awkward, but tomorrow morning would be exactly right. Then the sun will be just where I want it. The boy read a book until daylight faded. Then he remembered about waving his shirt from the tower, so up he went, hoping he hadn't left it too late for Lucy Ann to see. He stood on the top of the tower and stripped off his white shirt. Then he waved it gaily in the strong breeze there, looking down on the cottage far below as he waved. And from the topmost window there came a flash of white. Lucy Ann was waving back. He's just waved, she called to Dinah, who was undressing. I saw the white shirt. Oh, good. Now I know he's all right, and will soon be curling himself up to go to sleep. Why you must fuss so about Jack, I don't know, said Dinah, jumping into bed. I never fuss about Philip. You're silly, Lucy Ann. I don't care, thought Lucy Ann, as she settled down in bed. I'm glad to know Jack is safe. Somehow I don't like him being all alone in that horrid old castle. Jack went down the stone stairways of the tower, whistling softly. Kiki whistled with him. If it was a tune she knew, she would whistle it all through with Jack. They came into the old courtyard. There was no sign of the eagles. They were probably roosting now, but at Jack's coming there was a general scurrying all around the yard. <laughs> Rabbits! said Jack in delight. Golly! <laughs> what hundreds of them! He went over to the soft sand, taking with him the thick rugs and a packet of chocolate biscuits. He curled himself up and lay there, watching the rabbits creeping out of their holes again. I bet the eagles catch a good few of those rabbits, thought Jack, suddenly feeling sleepy. He finished his last biscuit, pulled the rugs more closely around him and went to sleep. What woke Jack? He never knew, but something woke him with a jump. He sat up, and Kiki awoke too giving an annoyed little squawk. 
I wonder what woke me, thought Jack, looking round the shadowy yard. He listened intently, but he could hear nothing save the hoot of an owl on the hillside. He glanced up at the tower from which he'd waved his white shirt, and suddenly stiffened in surprise. Surely that was a light he saw flash there. He stared intently, waiting for it to come again. It had seemed rather like the sudden flash of a torch, but it didn't come again. It seemed rather weird. Jack wondered what to do. He didn't really feel inclined to get up and find out what the flash was, if it had been a flash. He was beginning to doubt that it was now. If only it would come again, he would know. Warning Kitty to be quiet, he made his way very carefully across the yard to the entrance of the castle, keeping in the blackest shadows. The feel of Kiki's feet on his shoulder was somehow very comforting. He went into the vast hall and listened. There was not a sound to be heard. He switched on his torch, cautiously covering it with his handkerchief. The hall was empty. Jack went up the wide stone stairway and found his way to the wall that led to the tower. He walked quietly along it, keeping close to one edge, and soon came to the tower. Shall I go up or not? wondered the boy. I don't want to in the least. If there's anyone there, they can't be up to any good. Did I imagine that flash? He screwed up his courage and stole up the tower stairway. There was no one in the tower room. He crept up the stairway that led to the very top and put his head carefully out. The moon's light was enough to show him that there was nobody there either. Well, I just must have imagined it, thought the boy. How silly of me. I'll go back to bed again. Down he went once more, Kiki still on his shoulder. As he came into the wide hall, he suddenly stopped still. He had heard a sound. What could it be? It sounded like a muffled clanking, and then, surely, that was the splash of water. Is it somebody in the kitchen? Somebody getting a drink of water again? wondered Jack, feeling a prickle of panic go down his back. Golly, I don't like this. I wish the others were here. Then, overcome by fear, he fled out of the hall and into the moonlight yard, keeping in the shadows. He was trembling. In a minute or two, he was ashamed of himself. Why am I running away, he thought. This won't do. Just to show myself that I'm no coward, I'll walk into that kitchen and see who's there. It's a tramp, I expect, who knows the way in. He'll be far more frightened to see me than I shall be to see him. Boldly, but very quickly, the boy went back into the dark, brooding castle. Through the hall he went, and made his way softly to the kitchen entrance. He slipped inside the doorway, and then went behind the door where he waited, listening and watching to see if any light was shown. But there was dead silence. There was no clank of the pump, there was no splash of water. Jack waited for two or three minutes with Kiki perfectly silent. He couldn't even hear anyone breathing. The kitchen must be empty. I'll switch on my torch very quickly, flash it round the kitchen, and see if there's anyone standing quietly there, he thought. I can easily run out of the door if there is. So he took his torch from his pocket, and suddenly pressed down the switch. He flashed it to the sink where the pump stood. There was no one there. He flashed it all around the kitchen. It was quite empty. There was no sign of anyone at all. Jack heaved a sigh of relief. He went across to the sink and examined the floor beside it. There was, again, a puddle there. But was it a freshly made one from the sink splashes? Or was it the same one they themselves had made when they used the pump? Jack couldn't tell. It's a puzzle he said to Kiki in a whisper. I suppose the clank and splashing were all my silly imagination. I was frightened, and people always imagine things then. I imagined that flash in the tower, and I imagined the clanking noise and the splashing. Kiki, <laughs> I'm as timid as Lucy Ann. I really am. Still feeling a bit puzzled, but rather ashamed of all his fears and alarms, Jack went back to his bed in the courtyard. It seemed uncomfortably hard now. Also, he was a bit cold. He pulled the rugs round him and tried to get comfortable. He shut his eyes and told himself to go to sleep. 
The moon seemed to have gone now, and everything was pitch black. Whatever he heard or saw, Jack was determined he was not going to leave his bed again that night. At last he fell asleep, just as the dawn was making the eastern sky silvery. He didn't see it turn gold and pink, nor did he see the first soaring flight of the two eagles. He slept soundly, and so did Kiki. But she awoke at the first yelping scream of one of the eagles and answered it with one of her marvellous imitations. That woke Jack with a jump and he sat up. Kiki flew off his shoulder, waited till he called her, and flew back again. Jack rubbed his eyes and yawned. Oh, oh, I'm hungry, he said to Kiki. Are you? Kiki scratched her beak with one of her feet and looked at Jack. Uh, what a pity! What a pity! she remarked. Yes, I think it was a pity we disturbed ourselves too much, said Jack. I was an idiot, Kiki. Now that it's broad daylight and I'm wide awake, I begin to think I must have dreamt or imagined all that happened in the night. Not that anything much did happen anyway. <laughs> Kiki listened with her head on one side. Jack unwrapped himself from the rug. I tell you what, Kiki, we won't either of us mention that flash in the tower or that mysterious clanking or splashing we thought we heard, see? The others would only laugh at us, and Lucy Ann and Tassie might be frightened. I'm sure it was all my imagination. After he'd had his breakfast, Jack went to his hide. He wrapped the thickest rug round him and crawled in through the prickly stems of the gorse. Kiki remained outside this time. When he was in the hollow centre of the bush, Jack examined his camera to make sure it was all right. It was. He looked through the shutter to see if he had it trained exactly on the nest. Perfect, he thought. That young eagle appears to be asleep. I might get a good picture when it wakes up. I suppose the other birds are soaring miles high into the sky. It was boring waiting for the eagle to wake up, but Jack didn't mind. Both he and Philip knew that the ability to keep absolutely still and silent for a long time on end was essential to the study of birds and animals in their natural surroundings. So Jack settled back in the gorse bush and waited. The young eagle suddenly awoke and stretched out first one wing and then the other. It climbed to the edge of the nest and looked out over the ledge, waiting for its parents to come back. Fine, whispered Jack and pressed the trigger of the camera to take the eagle's picture. Then, with yelps, the two grown eagles came gliding down on outspread wings, and the young one greeted them gladly, spreading out its wings and quivering them. One of the eagles had a young hare clutched in its claws. It dropped it into the nest. At once, the youngster covered the food with its big wings, cowered over it, and began to pull at it hungrily with its powerful beak. Jack snapped it. All three birds heard the click and looked towards the gorse bush suspiciously. The young one fell upon its meal and ate until it could eat no more. Then it sank back into the big nest. The female eagle finished the dead hare in a very short while. Jack got another wonderful snap whilst it was tearing up its food. This time, except for an inquiring look in the direction of the click, the eagles took no notice. Good, thought Jack. They won't mind the click soon or the gleaming eye of the camera. He spent a pleasant morning using up the rest of his film, delighted to think of the wonderful pictures he could develop. Kiki suddenly gave a most excited squawk, making the two grown eagles rise in the air in alarm. She flew into the air and made for the wall that ran round the courtyard. Jack, peering through the back of his hiding place, saw her fly right over the wall and disappear. Now where's she gone, he thought. I was just going to take a picture of her and the two eagles together. Kiki was gone for about half an hour before Jack saw her again. Then she came into the courtyard on Tassie's shoulder. She had heard the other children coming up the hillside and had flown to meet them. They had got into the castle in the usual way and were now looking for Jack. The eagles soared into the air when they heard the children coming towards their crag. Jack gave a hail from the inside of his hide. I'm here! Hello, it's good to see you. Wait a sec and I'll be out. He crawled out with the rug round him and went down to the others. Lucy Ann eyed him anxiously and was relieved to see him looking cheerful and well. We brought a fine dinner, said Philip. Mother managed to get some cooked ham and a big fruit cake in the village. Oh, good, said Jack, realising he was terribly hungry. 
We've got some ginger beer, too, said Dinah. Where shall we have our dinner, on top of the tower again, or where? Uh, here, I think, said Jack, because the light is perfect for taking pictures this morning, and if those eagles come back, I want a few more snaps of them. I have an idea they're going to make that young one fly soon. The female eagle tried to tip it off the edge of the nest this morning. What sort of a night did you have, Jack? asked Lucianne, who was sitting as close to Jack as she could. Well, very good, said Jack airily. I woke up once, took some time to go to sleep again. He was determined not to say anything about his alarms and fears in the night. They seemed so silly now in the full sunshine with people all around him. The four children stayed with Jack till after tea. Each crept into his hide to watch the eagles. They went up to the tower again, and Jack cautiously looked round to see if anything was different about the tower. A cigarette end, a scrap of paper, but there was nothing at all. "'Won't you come back with us tonight, Jack?' asked Lucianne. "'Course not,' said Jack, though secretly he felt he would rather like to. "'Is it likely, just as I'm certain that young eagle is going to learn to fly?' Oh, "'All right,' said Lucianne with a sigh. I don't know why I hate you being here alone in this horrid old castle, but I just do. Eh, it's time to go, said Philip, getting up. We brought you another rug, Jack, in case you felt cold. Coming to see us off at the window? Yes, of course, said Jack. And they all went inside the castle, their footsteps echoing on the stone floor. They went to the room where the plank reached to the windowsill, and one by one they got across. Lucy Anne called a farewell to Jack. Thank you for waving your shirt to me last night, she called. And, oh, Jack, I saw you flashing your torch from the tower later on, too. I was in bed, but I was awake, and I saw the flash of the torch three or four times. It was nice of you to do that. I was glad to see it and to know you were awake, too. Come on, Lucy Ann, for goodness sake, called Dinah. All right, I'm coming, said Lucy Ann, and slid down the creepers to the ground. Everyone called goodbye, and then they were gone. But Jack was left feeling most puzzled and uncomfortable. So there had been someone in the tower last night flashing a torch. He hadn't dreamt it or imagined it. It was true. Lucy Anne saw it. So that proves I wasn't mistaken as I thought, said the boy to himself as he went back into the courtyard. It's terribly mysterious. That clanking I heard... And the splashing must have been real, too. There is someone else here. But who? And why? He wished now that he'd told the others the happenings in the night. Shall I go after the others and join them? he thought. No, I won't. I'll wait and try and find out who's here. Fancy Lucy Ann seeing those flashes. I am glad she told me. Jack wandered back to his hide. He felt safe there. He was sure no one would ever think of looking in the very middle of a prickly, thick gorse bush for anyone. As evening fell, he felt sleepy. Should he try and go to sleep now and keep awake later on? Could he possibly go to sleep in the hollow gorse bush? He curled up in the thickest rug and made a pillow of another one. Kiki crawled in beside him and perched uncomfortably on his knees. Jack slept for a time. Then he awoke suddenly, feeling dreadfully uncomfortable. He looked at the phosphorescent hands of his watch and saw that it was ten past midnight. Hmm, said Jack. Just about the time that someone in the castle starts to wake up. I'd better get out of here and watch and listen. He crept painfully out of the bush and, climbing silently down the crag, came into the yard and stood listening. There was no sound to be heard except the wind blowing fairly hard. And then Jack thought he heard the far-off sound of water splashing again and the clank of the pump handle. He stood listening. After a while, he felt sure he heard quiet footsteps on stone somewhere. Was it someone walking on the castle wall, going to the tower to flash a torch again? Well... If he's gone to the tower, he's safely out of the castle, thought Jack. I'll go in and see if I can discover where he hides. He must live somewhere.